Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. Yesterday, as Sony announced the RX100 Mark VI, a horrible case of food poisoning was doing unspeakable things to my body. I know, TMI. But the day before, Claudia and I were out on the streets and rivers of Manhattan, shooting with a pile of other gear, inspired by Brian Smith's talk that same day on street photography, our interview posted a week earlier with legendary Magnum photographer Elliot Erwitt, who a little bit I fell in love with. And our interview posted two weeks before that with Foundation Henri Cartier-Bresson's director, Agnes Sear. Now, I'm going to put links to all of those down below and up above. And the reason why I'm doing that, because all three lines, uh, two lions and a lioness, of photography, put me in a very particular frame of mind today to think about Sony's latest one-inch sensor pocket model. So here's what I think in what I can only call a preview of the six, based on my experience with a pile of one-inch sensor Sony cameras, uh, including the RX104 I owned. I'll post those reviews down below and up above as well. And Sony's live stream yesterday. Reduced to its essence, I think the Mark VI addresses the two biggest reasons why I ended up returning the Mark IV. The too short 70 millimeter full frame equivalent limit at the top end, and I'll just leave out full frame from now on, you know what I'm talking about. And the two step, too annoying pop up EVF. By extending the long end to 200 millimeters and refining the EVF mechanism so that it's a one touch in or out process, I think Sony has turned its RX100 into a very interesting do it all street travel casual sports blogging camera. That's because, one, it's what I'd hoped the 4 would be, and two, it does the things that the best smartphone cameras can't, even with dual lens sensor units. The EVF, same resolution and technologies in the 5, is now accessible quickly enough that by the time you bring it up to your eye after pulling it out of your pocket, you're ready to go. It's less obtrusive than before because you're not futzing around with the thing, it's just there. And the camera is so small as before, so visually indistinct at any distance your subject on the street might be from you. No red dot or stonking big 24 to 70 millimeter 2.8 zoom to give you away, that it truly does reduce the likelihood of any, what do you think you're doing, unpleasantness. Hold that thought. With a 200 millimeter top end, we're now better able to isolate our subjects by bringing them closer if not by shallower depth of field, but hold that thought too. Finally, the 180 degree flip over, sounds like comb over, screen carried over from the five, allows you to shoot 20 megapixel stills or 4K videos of yourself at the highest resolution of which the camera is capable. Now, smartphones don't have any of these things. An EVF, a full frame equivalent top end of 200 millimeters, the ability to record at highest resolution, because remember, with smartphones, you're talking the front-facing camera, which, generally speaking, shoots at a lower resolution and most often does not have image stabilization. And these make a big difference. Unless they don't. So, yeah, hold this thought yet again. And you can check me, make sure that I come back to all of this stuff. Now, the rest of the stuff. Continuous improvement, always a good thing though dramatically less impactful than these first two items. Sony says that the image stabilization is now four stops, but I don't recall and couldn't find online what it is on the 5 or was on the 4. I do recall that the 5 image stabilization was not as good as in iPhones, and the 5.5 stops of IBIS on the A7 III is not as good as that on the GH5, so it will be interesting to go hands-on to see for myself. The rear LCD now offers touch focus, and if my experience with the RX10 IV that we tested in September is any indication, and it is, it should actually be pretty good. Looks like they've lowered the resolution from 1.2 million dots to 920,000 on the other hand, which, by the way, are not megapixels. The megapixel count is actually lower, but I don't know how that translates in the field, nor do I know if the new screen is any brighter, so I'm looking forward to checking that out as well. And of course, it's only touch focus. The menu system and the absence of touch focus to navigate it remain. 
Sony says the autofocus is even better. But again, judging by the RX10 Mark IV and Sony's Z90 dedicated camera, both using either the identical chip and processor or some measure of upgrade, I'm not quite sure which, AF was already excellent. The really interesting thing here is the claim about the improvements in IAF, which is an astonishing technology, as we saw when we tested the A9, the A7R3, and now the A7 III. The buffer is bigger, so that insanely great 24 frames per second with autofocus, no blackout burst mode, is even more insane, but you know, hold this thought. Hybrid log gamma and high dynamic range, well, still earliest days, still 8-bit, still dependent on connection to a compatible Sony TV. I might feel differently if I were to see it in person, but I haven't yet had the opportunity. Timecode and proxy recording, interesting. Useful if you're using a bunch of them. Clean HDMI out, useful. Especially if you want to go longer than five minutes in 4K, but that's a bit of a Rube Goldberg-esque Faustian bargain. I mean, what gets you first? Overheating or the extra complexity? I don't know. S-Log? I don't imagine many people using this camera would go to the trouble in post, but I've been wrong before. Battery life? Profoundly meh. But with all of this said, let's now address those thoughts you've been holding, in order, good and bad. First, that EVF is small. 0.59x magnification compared to, say, 0.72x for a Leica M6 or 0.83 in a Panasonic G9. In bright daylight, I still had to cup the EVF with my hand on the 4, which makes it difficult. So it will be interesting to see if the display improves the experience in bright light on the 6, which is, at the end of the day, a primary value of an EVF in the first place. Second, while we now have a dramatically longer top end compared to the Mark 4 and 5's full frame equivalent, I'm saying it again, of 70 millimeters, the reduction in maximum aperture at 200 millimeters to 4.5 from the 5's 2.8 at 70 millimeters, effectively cancels out any advantage it would have brought when it comes to blurring the background, which is important for portraits. In this regard, the computational imaging of smartphone cameras like the iPhone 10, for casual social media purposes, may actually be a superior solution. It depends on how closely one looks. I think at normal viewing distances, using a smartphone or a tablet. The computed background blur of the smartphone will be significantly better at distinguishing subject from surroundings. And yes, I understand it's not perfect and blah, 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 blah. Now, using one of my favorite apps, PCAM, I calculated that depth of field difference. For the same field of view, depth of field is about one inch worse at 7.4 inches on the 6 fully extended to 77 millimeters than it is on the Mark IV fully extended to 25 millimeters at 6.3 inches. In either case, they can't hold a candle to the shallow depth of field of even an APS-C camera like Sony's A6300, which we own, or the A6500, mated to Sony's recently introduced 85mm f1.8, for example, which, for the same field of view, is about 1.2 inches, which is pretty bocalicious. And pretty interesting, because the in-body image stabilized APS-C censored interchangeable lens A6500 with that 85mm 1.8 will set you back an additional 400 bucks, 1600 versus 1200 for the 6. Though, then again, that's just one lens. And say the terrific 24 to 105 f4 would set you back more than the price of the 6 all by itself, yet still not give you the same effective range as the Zeiss Varia Sonar in the 6. On the other hand, it's also true that while we know the IQ of the 24 to 105 because we not only tested one but bought one with our own hard cash, and we know the IQ of the Zeiss 24 to 600 millimeter full frame equivalent, there I go saying it again, built into the RX10 Mark IV after extensive testing, we don't know the IQ of this new sonar. My guess is that it's tack sharp, but I'm less certain about things like chromatic aberration or flaring. I just haven't had it in hand. It's a new lens and it's aimed primarily at the consumer space. This is especially important because there's no built-in lens hood, nor the possibility of screwing one in, as is similarly the case with something like neutral density filters, which become necessary, especially when you're shooting video, because the internal ND in the 5 is gone. But 
the opportunity to use that insane 24 frames per second first introduced on the 5 is now better realized on the 6 because of the extended reach of the lens. I mean, a sick high burst rate. And sports go together, but sports usually require longer focal lengths, which the 6 delivers. And then again, that 4.5 maximum aperture, the need for higher, shorter speeds to freeze the action, and that 1 inch sensor, no matter how good it is, combine to make good lighting mandatory. Because you got to jack the ISO. Fine if you're shooting an outdoor tennis match, probably more difficult to shoot an indoor swim meet where stepping up the ISO high enough to capture the action may push you into noise levels or color degradation you don't want. Even if, in our testing, the similarly censored RX10 Mark IV and III's high ISO performance gave us impressive results, though to circle back to subject isolation could do things with their longer top end that the RX106 cannot. When it comes to the 4K selfie mode, it's important to note that while the sensor in the RX100 Mark VI is capable of superb 4K video, it's capped at 5 minutes and does not have a mic jack, which makes it not particularly interesting to documentarians and YouTubers like me unless you record audio separately, though if you're willing to shoot a 1080 at least, you can get to half an hour. In theory. I haven't tried it. And that's a small body. Anyway, this all takes us finally to use cases and the difference between specs in the abstract and results in the field along with cost, although I'm still theorizing. My sense is that the RX100 Mark VI is actually a superb street photography camera for anyone dedicated to the genre. An excellent travel camera for casual users, even those who are enthusiasts. I mean, it's interesting to me. An okay sports camera for family and a passable in-the-clutch blogging camera when you have to travel or want to travel or don't have the budget to do anything but go super duper duper super light and small. I mean, if you think about it, Cartier-Bresson probably shot around, what, F8 most of the time? Because he shot in daylight and probably zone-focused or pre-focused as he certainly did for his famous Saint-Lazare image, usually with a 50mm lens, often with a 35. With the RX106, you can approximate the same field of view and same depth of field at 2.8. Combine that with a 24 frames per second burst rate in both an EVF and AF system that are dramatically better than the pre-M Leicas that Cartier-Bresson and Erwitt relied upon back in the day. Never mind an even smaller package with the advantage of a tilty screen so that you can peer down rather than at your subject the way Elliot would have with his Raleigh Flex. And it's clear to me that the RX100 Mark VI is spec to be just an amazing machine for street photography. I'll reserve judgment on the ergos and final IQ until I've used it in anger, as the Brits would say. When it comes to travel, the RX106 gives you the reach, EVF, and full resolution, dynamic range, and low-light performance of a larger sensor that smartphones cannot. And with a 7.25 crop factor of, say, an iPhone 8 Plus, the resultant full-frame depth of field equivalent of f13 for the phone's wide-angle lens and f20 for what passes as telephoto, actually only 55mm full-frame equivalent, the relatively deep depth of field weakness of the RX106 compared to larger format cameras, melts away when compared to smartphones, which is the relevant genre, I think, since interchangeable lens cameras, even fixed lens cameras in the APS-C or micro four-thirds uh, size, are less and less the competition for travel cameras, when bokeh is usually not at the top of the list anyway. Now, I've already spoken about sports and the limitations that the high shutter speed, slow maximum aperture at the long end, and one inch sensor in low light place on when and where you can shoot with optimal results. But it's worth pointing out that sometimes even noisy images are awesome. As I keep mentioning, my friend and Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Brian Smith's shot of gold medalist diver Greg Louganis smacking his head on the diving board at the 88 Olympics was shot on grainy as hell ISO 1635mm film and then dramatically cropped, yet remains no less amazing for it. When it comes to blogging, I personally find it almost impossible to communicate what I want to 
in less than five minutes. You know that. But then that's because of what, how I choose to share. And yeah, okay, my, what do you want to call it? 0.85x speaking cadence. What can I say? Thinking takes me time. And I both record and render in 4K because of my own personal standards. But in the spirit of the best camera is the one you have with you, I can see carrying the 6 on me all the time, just the way I do my wallet, car, keys, and iPhone 10. In which case, it is a far better tool for high quality imagery. But then again, if I were suddenly caught in a newsworthy event, I could live stream on my phone uninterrupted for as long as my battery would last. Yeah, it would be at lower resolution using the front facing camera. But if we're speaking about the revolution being televised, even today the right smartphone would be a better choice than the RX100 Mark VI. Which leaves us where, really? Well, since I've already spelled out how well it works and what I suspect are the most relevant use cases, in the final analysis, the RX100 Mark VI is a reaffirmation that Sony is massively clever, focused, innovative, and forward-leaning. I mean, really, a one-inch censored camera as the ultimate street photography tool. With higher burst rates and better autofocus than just about every micro four-thirds, APS-C, and even some full-frame cameras? From a broader perspective, a business perspective, these kinds of improvements allow Sony to jack the price of the 6 26% over the 5, 40% over the 4, 92% over the 3, 119% over the 2, and 240% over the original, all still available. I don't begrudge them this at all. In fact, bravo. It gives Sony the cash flow and amortized development costs necessary to continue innovating, and we are all the richer for it. Though, I still wish they'd improve their ergos, menu, and touch interface. Most interesting of all to me, as always, your mileage may vary, it is intriguing to imagine Sony pouring so much effort into the one-inch sensor as a way of weakening the argument for micro-thirds cameras altogether, especially if it were to decide to go the route of interchangeable lenses. In this regard and at this rate, we can anticipate that day, as well as the day when it will weaken the argument for APS-C as well. Which, as I come to think of it, may be the reason why we've seen so little effort from Sony to build out the APS-C EMAP Prime Lens lineup. At least, that's what I think at the moment. I'd love to read your take in the comments section below. Pre-ordering begins tomorrow, with shipments expected to begin in July. I'd really like to go hands-on with this camera. I think Sony is going to sell boatloads of them. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation in the comments section below. You guys are just so sharp and so generous. Just wow. Share, create a playlist, consider supporting our work by using our no cost to you affiliate links down below or making a contribution directly via the PayPal link down below. As always, we thank you for it.